Tiling textures are a big part of 3D assets. It's a way where you can take one image that repeats on the left and right side and on the top and bottom, and as a result, uh, throw it onto something like a giant castle or an infinite field, and the texture will always repeat, and you won't have any seams where uh, it obviously looks like there's some sort of problem. Uh, this is a program called Materialize, and it's one of the places that I like to generate textures because it can generate some of these extra maps really fast. And this is another thing I wanted to talk about today, which is the different sort of information that affects your 3D objects. We're going to start in Photoshop. The first thing we need is some sort of image. So I'm going to start with this picture of bricks. It's nothing fancy, right? Uh, it does ha have CR2 data, so if you shot a picture with your phone, you might not be able to adjust it as much. But, uh, you know, it's totally fine to just walk around and take pictures of walls and carpets and wood and uh, have that as a library of stuff. We're going to take this into Photoshop and not only get it tiling, but also get it as a baseline that we can bring in to materialize to make our other maps. Now I'm going to start by going to image canvas size and I am going to make this a 2048 by 2048 texture. Huh. Actually let me redo that. Actually, instead of creating this or resizing this document, I'm going to create a new document that is exactly 2048 by 2048. You'll see a lot of these repeating numbers in 3D, which is 512, uh, 10, 1024, 2048. It's because they're all squares. Uh, they're all powers of two. And as a result, they can operate a little faster. I like to, instead of having that as a new document, I like to click and drag this into my new document. And now, as a result, I can move this around and I have all this pixel detail, right? Now the next question is, how do I make this repeat? I'm going to start by just lining up one corner of this, which is going to be this over here. And I'm going to have this start off with that grout. And then I'm going to hit Control-T for Transform, Edit, Free Transform. And if I know I have that correct, I can sort of go like that. And what I need is some sort of uh, scaling where it's like two bricks and then one and a half bricks. Right click and switch this to distort. And I'm just going to move this around until it's kind of all correct. Right around there, maybe a little more here. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's probably good enough. Oh, fine. I keep getting nitpicky now about how much grout is on each side. So, about there on that grout. 
So this is sort of the first step is just having a sense of uh, how is this going to tile. Next, I'm going to right click. I'm going to make this into a smart object. And that's going to mean that if I control T this, no, that's not what I want. Never mind. Don't do that. I'm going to select this and hit control J. So this is going to be one where it only has that exact square. Filter. Now I'm going to offset this so that these seams are going to be in the direct center and we'll be able to see all the problems that brings up. Filter. Other. Offset. And 512 by, wait, 1024 by 1024 is going to make it so that you can start seeing some of the problems. It might not be obvious right away, but there's just slight problems like that. So there's a couple ways we could fix this. I think, you know, most people's first instinct is something like the clone stamp brush, which is S for stamp. And when you have the clone stamp brush, you can hold Alt or Option and click on a point. And then I could zoom in on this other point and just paint that in as something that moves it. There's also the healing brush stamp, uh, the, healing, the spot healing and the healing brush tool. So this will make it hopefully just paint away. Although that's also a case where sometimes having a source is a little preferred. So I'm going to use Shift J to toggle between these tools. And the patch tool is one that I like a lot. The patch tool lets me select an area and then kind of move that patch over to where I think it's going to work best. So you can see the benefit of this, which is it sort of auto aligns the stuff that you care about. This isn't always the case uh, that you want to use. Uh, I'm going to unhide that starting document. This is the one where I have the larger bricks. And I think a lot of times it's really handy to just have, you know, one brick over here that I just manually select. I'm going to feather that. I'm going to blur it. So this is going to make it so that the boundaries aren't so sharp. And if I just hit Control J, now I've got this floating brick. And a lot of times that's something that's just a little more pleasant to manually thrust onto something. Like right here. So looking at this earlier file, I think maybe another thing I would grab strips of. I'm going to use the lasso tool, and I'm going to actually set this at a manual starting feather of like 15 pixels. And now when I make a selection with this, you'll notice that it's automatically feathered. I'm going to hit Control J to duplicate that off. And I can once again just start using this as a means of things up. So for instance, right there, I was noticing that there needs to be a little more moss in there. So let's just call it there. That's, a, that's good enough. That's probably fine. Now when I use filter other offset, so I not going to do that, but it's just something where I'm using this to test where there's still problems. And I think the last one is right here. Yeah, you see that seam there? That's the sort of thing that you end up just looking around for.
So having done that, what is the next step? Like I said, I'm going to merge that down. One thing that can cause problems is if there's too much color variance and like this one spot of red repeats over and over. So the bricks don't have any seams that you can see, but something is duplicating. And this is where uh, I oftentimes like to separate out color versus luminance. So I'm going to duplicate that layer. And we can basically do this two ways. This top one could be our baseline. Or so I'll make three. So I could set this uh, top one to luminosity. And this one to color. And then we can actually work on these separately. So with this one set to luminosity, let's start by just setting it to normal. And I'll show you a filter that I oftentimes use. The high pass filter um, sort of at, uses a radius of pixels to average out details. So if I bring this all the way up, you can see it's um, just doing things. But the nice thing is it does tile this while it does it. So if I do something like that, what this will have done is sort of average out a lot of that uh, detail. So there's before, after. Now if I set this to uh, luminosity, that's going to mean that it uses the color from the below one while using this for the value. So for instance, if I suck all the color data out, it doesn't do anything now. And this is something where now I can just maybe adjust this. This is also a technique for like delighting sometimes. Now on this one, <coughs> I'm going to use a brush and set this to color. And maybe take out some of these red patches. Yeah, sure, good enough. So now when I export this, export as. I feel like I'm going to use offset one more time, set to zero. I just want a little more of that grout on the top. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to export this. Quick export. Quick export is ping. Sure. You can see that I already did this once. So I'm going to create a new one called. And I'm going to save this as bricks. And then usually you can underscore and then put something like C for color uh, or D for diffuse. And we're going to load that into materialize. Now before I do that, it is worth mentioning that what we're going to do is derive several maps from this color map. And there's no reason you can't do that in uh, Photoshop. For instance, filter 3D generate uh, height map something you can do right here. I just tend to like the um, immediacy of seeing how it looks. Yeah, you can see um, Photoshop's 3D features are being discontinued because they're trying to move us towards Substance. Uh, since they bought Substance Designer and Substance Painter, now they want you using that rather than Photoshop. But you can see that it's generating some sort of height map. Again, I don't care about that. I'm going to use Materialize. So let's create a 
a new project. Materialize is free. It's open source and it was used on a number of high-end games. So when you get this dialog, uh, these stand for like process, something. I think this is like process or something. We want to click this O, which stands for open. So on diffuse map, I'm going to click open. And we go find Highlight textures, picture, and bricks too. There's my bricks. Now when I load this in, you'll notice that I have a 3D object, which I can rotate around using the right mouse button, little mouse wheel in and out. And this is just an interface that's going to uh, derive other maps from this in the same way that you could just use a series of Photoshop filters. Uh, in fact, back in the day, that's what you had to do. Uh, I like to uh, click on show material or show full material and go to cube. And automatically you can see that um, we need those other maps in a hurry. The first one we're going to do is the height map, which is going to give us the information to generate a lot of these other ones. So when I click create, it's going to give me this viewer that tells me um, where is the um, diffuse map that I'm using to generate this from. This little uh, pulley show lets you like toggle between them. And now I'm going to start messing around with these until I got something that I like. Now what a height map does is imagine it's neutral gray, like 50% gray. Anywhere that it says a white pixel, it's going to go up in space. Anywhere that it's a uh, dark pixel it's going to go down. So this is something where uh, the height map actually does not get too high contrast and uh, you know a lot of this is stuff where if we increase the frequency of these or mess around with them it's gonna create something might as well just hit set and really the place you want to see this is by showing the full material. So here we can see how much of this is coming in and how much of it's coming out. So you might look at this and realize that the stones are coming out too much and the grout is coming out not enough. So I'm going to go back to create and maybe mess with those sliders so that yeah, these are nice. The defaults Include one for you know a default map, one that's more detail oriented. So if you wanted to focus on the rocks, and then displacement oriented is a little more heavy on the displacement. Probably need a little bit of those rocks. Similarly, there's this. Now you can't really trust this uh, with your eye because, oh yeah, that's what I like. because really you can only see its effect on the 3D model. So that's looking a little grouttier. Maybe the rocks need a little more. <laughs> and here we have pretty insane amount. You can see what happens if you go too far off that neutral gray. Uh, I'm going to go back to default and lower that final contrast. That looks pretty good. Next we're going to create a normal map. Now a normal map, when I create it, it's going to give you this funky blue and pink and uh, teal color. Uh, what's happening with a normal map is that imagine you know you have a plane and there's a normal poking out. This represents the plane in 3D space. What they do with the normal map is they map that idea of straight up and down to a default color of 50% blue uh, or 50% red, 50% blue, and oh wait, 
50% red and green, and then 100% blue. The 100% blue means it's pointing up. And the 50% red and green basically determine uh, is it moving more this way or this way, or forward or backwards. So if it's 50%, it's pointing straight up. As a result, when you use these slight color differentiations, you're saying on a pixel level, render this as if it's pointing that way or this way. All of which is to say, we once again can really only tell this stuff if we use a material. So, oh yeah, I gotta hit create. And I'll just set normal map for that. Metallic maps are something where you need to understand right off the bat that this is based on something called PBR texturing or physically based uh, rendering. And in PBR, in the, met in the metallic workflow, uh, substances either have metal or not metal. There's no in between. So uh, if you hit create, it's probably going to give you something insane like this. None of this is metal, right? It's dirt. Uh, it's uh, grass. Nothing here is metal. Like maybe we could argue if like we found some little sil silica chunks. But nine times out of ten, uh, it's probably not going to be that. So I might just want to set the final bias to like way up. I probably wouldn't even use this. Something like that is probably ideal. Um, it really shouldn't be something where there is, yeah, luminance way up. Yeah, sure. Set. Oh, wait. No, that's the opposite of what I want. No, opposite of that. I want nothing metal. So metal going from uh, no to yes. Zero is no. One is yes. Zero is black. One is uh, white. So what I want is the opposite of this. I want a way, way, way super dark one. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, something like that. It should really just be pure black, but you know, for the sake of argument, there we are. Now, all of this is universally shiny right now, and that's because we have to make a smooth map. Now, smoothness, again, think smooth yes equals smooth one equals smooth white. So if it's pure white, that means everything is uh, going to be very, very smooth. So when I create this, uh, I need to think through that. So um, I think I want the opposite. I, uh, I sometimes see this in other programs as roughness. So sometimes you want the opposite. Um, uh, one would equal more rough and zero would equal more smooth. I suppose you can always just invert it either way. So uh, smoothness represents that if like if you had that flat surface, imagine a ray of light hits it and it bounce off, bounces off at a direct angle. And so four rays of light hitting, they would all four bounce in the same direction. Um, but what happens when you have a surface that's like scratched up a little bit? Then you have all these nooks and crannies. And so when that light ray hits, it might hit this and bounce back. It might hit here and do a glancing thing. And so it diffuses the light by like uh, moving it around. Yeah, so let's just set smoothness. And now you're seeing that this is starting to look a little more realistic. Yeah, sure. Create an edge map. Uh, edge maps and ambient occlusion maps are oftentimes used for secondary effects. So for instance, uh, this really deep in and out actually change that uh, ambient occlusion is something that you can render out in 3d and it's basically where 
uh, nooks and crannies happen, and as a result, light can't penetrate it. And so these are oftentimes used as a starting point for other things like rendering. Like it'll tell you where your lip lines are and stuff. Uh, but for our case, it's also something that oftentimes comes into a material and helps it to differentiate those like dark, dark cracks and crevices. I'm going to try and try this. Yeah, see, that's like, in this, it's one equals extra smooth. So notice that when I up that, it's just so shiny. So the more uh, I darken it, the less shiny it is. And this is something where you have to start thinking through it. Like maybe I need to do something where the, you know, the grass would maybe be less shiny than the rocks. So the rock should be more white. Anyways, now I just made a mess. But still, we're starting to see the finished effect of what happens when you combine these. And it all starts with just making sure that you can create a texture that uh, doesn't have any repetition issues. Anyways, if you want to learn more about Materialize, check out boundingboxsoftware.com slash materialize and make some repeating tiling textures.